the original owner of Abu Ubaidah's symbolic kefir. At the age of 19, he was put on Israel's wanted list with a red notice. Despite being wanted on a red notice, the Israeli Prime Minister at the time called him a legend and promised to drop all charges against him if he lived abroad for three years. One of the first members of the Izzad in Al-Qasim Brigades, the armed wing of Hamas. This week's guest in profile is Imad Akel, whose life was the subject of a movie. Before we start, I have a request for you. As GZT, we prepare each of our content for you after long researches and we pay special attention to every stage of our content. What motivates us for this is the feedback we receive from you. So I would be very happy if you subscribe to GZT right now, like our video and leave a comment. I want to mention again that I read all the comments. So let's get started. Who is Imad Akel? His full name is Imad Hassan Ibrahim Akel. You may also know him as Abu Hussein. He was born in 1971 in Jabalia refugee camp in the northern Gaza Strip. Because after the war in 1948, his family had to migrate there. What happened in 1948 is crucial for understanding Imad's life and purpose. In those years, the Palestinian territories were under the British mandate. Significantly, years of mandate rule ended on the same day that the State of Israel was established in this land, on May 14, 1948. Uh, the Jewish National Council convened in Tel Aviv and announced the establishment of a Jewish state in part of the Palestinian territories. I don't know whether you are surprised or not, eight hours after this announcement, the British mandate ended. There were now two states in the region and they were left alone. Israel and Palestine. On May 15th, Arab countries, including Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, declared war against Israel. About 700,000 Palestinians were displaced from their land during this war. Imad Akel's family was one of those families forced to flee their land. They left their homes and moved to Jabalia refugee camp. I told you that Imad was born there. His father was the muezzin of the mosque in the camp. Imad received his basic education in numerous schools in Jabalia camp. He did so well in his studies that he won first place not only in the camp but also in Beit Hanun. After high school, he enrolled in the Faculty of Pharmacy at Alamal Institute. However, he encountered a situation he had not anticipated. When he submitted his documents and completed the registration process, he was immediately arrested by the occupation forces and was unable to study. So why did they arrest a young man of his age? Imad started his resistance movement against the occupation by writing on the walls and on the cars of the occupiers and settlers. He participated in demonstrations and marches. Around the same time, Hamas was in the movement and the first intifada had begun, and at the age of 17, Imad became one of the first members of the Izzadin al-Qassam brigades, the armed wing of Hamas. He was at the forefront of the first intifada movement. For this very reason, he was put on trial by Israel. After 18 months of detention, he was released on March 1990. And what did he do when he got out? He wanted to continue his education. He was accepted to Hetton College in Amman, where he was to study Islamic law. But the Israeli government imposed a travel ban on Imad, so he could not study. He turned to military activities. He was tasked with liaison between the Martyrs Group, the vanguard of the Qasem Brigades, and the leadership. The main activity of this group was initially limited to targeting dangerous collaborators. Over time, however, these actions evolved into large-scale military operations against occupation patrols and soldiers. In December 1991, the Zionists were severely torturing some of the members of Izzadin al-Qassam they had captured. At this time, one of the detainees gave Imad's name. This began the process of Imad being followed by the Zionists. He was not only followed. At the age of 19, he was wanted in Israel on a red notice. He was number one on Israel's hit list. He experienced many assassinations. In fact, it got to the point where he survived more than seven assassinations and became known as Imad the Seven Souls. Imad made his first military action on May 4, 1992. Four men from the Qasem Brigades were to target the convoy of General Yossi Avni, the then Israeli police chief in the Gaza Strip. The group watched this convoy like a shadow for a period of two months. At exactly 7 o'clock on the morning of May 4, 1992, the convoy was to pass through Saladin Street. Two of the four members of the group were on observer duty. As the vehicle approached, they would notify the other two. The other team would hit the target from close range. That was the plan, but there was a problem with the plan. After the first car passed, they started shooting, and there was a clash. The Israeli general and two Israeli soldiers in the convoy were wounded and survived. The group disappeared after a chase with the occupation forces in the Al-Zaytun neighborhood. 
Unable to catch them, the occupation forces interrogated dozens of young people in the neighborhood, but to no avail. The group used two important weapons here. Carlo Gustav and the grenade. The Carlo Gustav rifle was a submachine gun produced in small factories in the Palestinian territories. The grenades were also homemade. Even if the operation did not turn out exactly as they wanted, this operation, which they carried out with small means and without any help from any state, made a great noise. Although the Israeli authorities did not accept the operation, the events that took place showed everyone the determination of the Qassam brigades and their will to fight. There were conflicting reports in the Israeli press that the police chief escaped unhurt and that the operation was a failure. Nevertheless, this event showed all Palestinian youth and Israel that there is a movement that can plan and bravely carry out the Jihad, even with limited means. After this operation, Imad moved first to the West Bank to form military groups, then to Beit Hanun because of its strategic location, and then to Ramallah. He continued to work everywhere. It's time to tell you about what I mentioned briefly at the beginning of the video. Isaac Rabin, the Israeli Prime Minister at the time, makes an offer to Imad Akil, whom he calls a legend, through his family. He promised that all charges against him would be dropped if their son would leave Palestine to live in Jordan for three years. Look, they are promising to drop all charges against a man who is wanted on a red notice and who has survived many assassinations. Akil's unforgettable response to this offer is still talked about today. Tell him that even if he uses all his power, I will not give up the resistance. What can anyone do to a young man whose biggest goal is to die for the sake of Allah and his homeland? Until the age of 22, Imad Akel carried out, according to Israeli data, nearly 40 operations. Now I would like to talk about one more of his operations that is known worldwide. Operation Musab bin Umair Mosque. This was his biggest operation. But before that, I have to tell you about the Oslo Accords, because this operation was a reaction to the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords was the first time that the Palestinian and Israeli leaders tried to reach a face-to-face -face agreement. On August 20, 1993, the parties met in Oslo, the capital of Norway. There was only one meeting, and in September of the same year, an agreement was signed in Washington under the mediation of Bill Clinton. Let me tell you who was involved in this agreement and what it entailed. Yasser Arafat, head of the Palestine Liberation Organization, Al-Fatah, and Israeli Prime Minister Isaac Rabin, the agreement was signed in a public ceremony, so it was quite crowded. The ceremony was also attended by Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestine Liberation Organization, Israeli Foreign Minister Simon Peres, U.S. Secretary General Warren Christopher, and Russian Foreign Minister Andrei Koziev. In this agreement, the Palestinian self-government was established and recognized as a temporary administration. It was agreed that the Israel Defense Forces, the IDF as we know it, would withdraw from Gaza and parts of the West Bank. The parties wrote letters of mutual recognition. In these letters of mutual recognition, the Palestine Liberation Organization pledged to recognize the State of Israel and reject violence. At the same time, Israel recognized the Palestinian Authority as the representative of the Palestinian people and a partner in negotiations. However, this agreement did not include any commitment to officially recognize the State of Palestine. In other words, there was no recognized Palestinian state or government. Five years later, the Oslo II Accords were concluded, but there was no such recognition, so Yasser Arafat had made such an agreement on behalf of the Palestinian people. At that time, he was forbidden to enter the Palestinian territories. The Oslo Accords allowed Yasser Arafat to return to the occupied Palestinian territories. Operation Musa bin Umayr was born as a reaction to this agreement. On September 12, 1993, the day before the Oslo ceremony on September 13th, the Izadin al Qassam brigades saw Yasser Arafat's agreement to such a deal as a sale of Palestinian and Jerusalem lands. That is why they wanted to draw media attention to themselves. Imad Akel and two of his friends from the Izadin al Qassam brigades began their first videotaped operation by deploying in an abandoned house next to the Musab bin Umayr mosque, overlooking the street where Israeli military jeeps would pass. They waited there for about four hours for the jeep to pass. When one of the members signaled the approach of the jeep, the operation began. As the video recording continued, Imad and his friend attacked the jeep. Three Israeli soldiers were killed and they confiscated two weapons from inside the car. All the international media were now talking about this incident. In the photos and videos that appeared in the media, there was the emblem of the al Qassam brigades. At the end of the operation, the Azadin al Qassam brigades assumed responsibility for this operation. Such an attack was never expected before the Oslo Accords. Now the international media was talking not about the Oslo Accords, but about how three men from a movement called Izzedin al Qassam were able to strike against the invincible Israeli army. The leader of this operation, Imad, was a master of disguise. 
His red kefiyeh, covering his whole face so that only his eyes are visible, is still a symbol of the Palestinian resistance. As I said at the beginning of the video, Imad Akil is the original owner of the red kefiyeh of Hamas spokesman Abu Ubaidah. For years, his identity was not found, even though he made a video after every operation, explaining the details of the operation. No one even knew his age. Of course, hiding well was not his only distinguishing feature. Zero distance operations were his invention. With the limited means at their disposal, he was able to strike his enemies from the closest distance. Another thing that distinguished him from everyone else was that he included photography in his operations. He had images of every operation. He not only took these photos, but also published them. And there is another important point that the main purpose of these operations was not to kill, but to destroy the image of the Israeli army as indestructible. And he succeeded. He cared about destroying the psychological structure of the military authorities and damaging their image. In this way, it aimed both to shake Israel and to encourage the Palestinian people. You may have wondered why, when I said how many operations he carried out, I said until the age of 22. On November 23, 1993, Imad Akel was assassinated. Imad and his friends were, were breaking their fasts in a house in the Shujajia neighborhood in the northern Gaza Strip. Then, when they went out of the house into the neighborhood, the informant Walid Hamdieh, a Palestinian agent, informed the occupation forces of their whereabouts. The Israeli army then surrounded the entire neighborhood and a clash broke out between the two sides. Imad Akel was killed by a shell that exploded in his face. An eyewitness who attended the funeral said that they found 70 bullet wounds and many stab wounds on his body. Imad Akel's farewell to the world received a great response by the public. Hamas declared three days of mourning. Even though the Israeli government imposed a curfew, people took to the streets. The whole population was very angry. Many people flocked to the Jibalia camp where Imad was born. Fires were lit. Neighborhoods were blocked with piles of stones and barricades. Palestinian people responded to Israeli army shells with stones. Participation in the Intifada movement has doubled. In the cities of Hebron, Bethlehem, Ramallah, Jenin, Nablus and Jerusalem, a comprehensive strike began. Schools, institutions, factories closed. Stores could not open their doors. In response to this assassination, Hamas organized an operation called Imad Akel and killed Israeli Colonel Meir Mintz. For days, there was a disproportionate confrontation between the people and the Israeli soldiers in the entire city, and the persecution of the people by the soldiers continued. This is how Imad was sent to his last journey, and we can see that he is still alive in hearts. In 2009, Al-Aqsan Media Network produced a feature-length film in Palestine called Imad Akel's Legend of Resistance. The movie tells the life story of Imad Akel, the commander of the Al-Qassam Brigades, who was assassinated on November 23, 1993. The movie was directed by Majid Jundia and written by Mahmoud Az-Zahar. You can currently find the movie on YouTube by searching for it in Arabic, but there are no subtitles in English or Turkish. I am Sina Oziyot, and today I have brought you a profile of Imad Akel. The original owner of Abu Ubaidah's symbolic kefiyeh. At the age of 19, he was put on Israel's wanted list with a red notice. Despite being wanted on a red notice, the Israeli Prime Minister at the time called him a legend and promised to drop all charges against him if he lived abroad for three years. 